Good day, folks. So today's topic is going to quickly cover the subject of ERA, or Explosive Reactive Armour. But rather than focus on the current applications, we're going to take a closer look at who actually invented it. And the answer might just surprise you. So first of all, what is Explosive Reactive Armour, or ERA? Well, this is a form of protection quite common on tanks today, particularly Russian tanks and older Israeli vehicles, and is easily identified, being a series of block-like structures attached all over the outside of the tank's armour. ERA falls under the general catchment of reactive armours, which is any form of protection designed to prevent the penetration of the vehicle by reacting to a shot striking the device itself, or in the immediate proximity of the strike in some cases. Its purpose is to disrupt, redirect or absorb the energy of the round to prevent or weaken its strike on the tank's main armour, or indeed in some cases it can become the primary defence on its own. Reactive armour comes in several varieties, explosive reactive armour being the common sample, consisting of a layer or layers of explosives sandwiched between typically steel plates that disrupt the incoming round. In shape charges, this will interfere with the formation and stability of the jet itself, diffusing the stream and reducing or nullifying its ability to perforate the plate behind. There are a lot of newer types of both explosive reactive and non-explosive reactive armours, but that's a topic for a different day. So with that said, who actually invented ERA? Well, let's take a look at good old Wikipedia. They state that the idea of a counter-explosion in armour was first proposed by the Russian Scientific Institute of Steel in 1949, and that the first pre-production models were produced during the 1960s, but delays, problems and the misguided belief that Russian tanks had adequate armour led to delays that did not see this type introduced until later. Meanwhile, a West German boffin under the name of Manfred Held carried out research for Israel in the late 60s, leading to its use and implementation in the 1982 Lebanon War. Today, both sides take credit for the discovery of the system, and both of them are wrong. The actual discovery can be traced back even earlier to the most unlikely of places, Australia, at the Maribyrnong Explosives Factory in 1944. This had come about due to the effectiveness of handheld Nazi shape charge weapons encountered by tanks, particularly after the Normandy landings. And while all sides in the war made some use of shape charge attacks, or had similar weapons, the overall use of these, which were quick and easy to produce, had a somewhat detrimental effect on the tank's crews. Various means and methods had been tried out, and tank crews would festoon their vehicles with various materials to try and prevent these rounds which were quite capable of piercing the thicker steel. Most commonly seen were sandbags and track links. In tests, the track links were shown to increase the protection by about 14% in total, and it was found that the type of track, the angle at which it was placed, and the protection it offered varied widely, with Sherman track, for example, proving much more successful than the Churchill-type track. And whether it was laid vertically or horizontally, could also help, or in fact impede, the vehicle. Another commonly seen method was concrete or sandbags. Now, contrary to pattern, this did work, at least against the smaller, more common German systems, and both scientific communities in Australia and the UK were able to replicate tests and prove this. At the Explosives Factory in September 1944, various tests were done on how to defeat these shape charge attacks. These tests consisted of trying out various armour schemes that had been tested elsewhere by the UK and the US as well as new materials. The armour tests replicated some of the American devices, such as spiked armour, standoff plate and glass armour, all with varying levels of success and with various downfalls. The spiked armour, for example, was found to be very effective, but could be countered by newer fuse types, and there was of course the risk to the crew while spaced armour was found to be more or less useless. But as well as testing the armour itself, the Aussies looked at using different sandwiches of materials. This included things like water, sand, gravel and rubber, where the sand was found to be quite effective. 
the tests also looked at oxidising agents, which had looked promising, but often came with a downside in that many of the materials used were also extremely toxic to humans, which is never really that desirable. However, in June 1944, an interim report was written, titled Report on Chemical Armour Methods of Defeating Shaped Charges. This involved placing a small amount of explosive filler between metal plates with a 1.2 inch steel top backed onto the main tank plate itself, which the charge was known to be able to penetrate. Testing showed that this explosive armour would defeat the shaped charge. They next proceeded to test this armour against the US M9A1 and the British No. 68 shape charge grenades, where it was found that the shape of the cone made little difference, but the material of the cone did, with the US one having vastly superior penetration. Ultimately, work would only be carried out in limited numbers, and not enough continuous tests were done to establish the exact amount of filler or the shape of the charge needed. But they did indeed become the first to realise that this system worked, and they were the first to test it. By the war's end, however, the UK, who had been given the results, saw no interest in this method, and the work was stopped. Meanwhile, over in the US, work was also done by the American research engineer and scientist Emerson Pugh at Carnegie Tech. He too recorded in his 1949 paper, A Survey of Devices for Protecting Vehicles Against Shaped Charges, that during the war years he had also considered working on a similar method. He later went on to be responsible for some composite armours using silicon-based inserts. He did record that the oxidising agents tested by the Aussies did not work in his opinion, but does give mention to the Australians using the explosive technique. Well guys, that's the end of this quick video. In conclusion, it's fairly safe to give credit to the Australians for pioneering what would become ERA years ahead of others, if not put into service. Sadly, the Australian contribution to both engineering and science is often overlooked in modern research, partially out of a natural attrition of time and loss of material, and partially as the documents are often buried deep under the chaff of later numerous publications, their work on the Sherman Firefly being one example. If you did like this, or learnt something new today, please do give us a like. We only ever use original source documents from archives to make sure that you have the most accurate picture. But until next time, tiddle pip.